John chapter 1, and we're just going to look at the first four verses together uh, today. Um, And I want to ask this question to start. Are you running from God? Are you running from God? Now, this morning, it might seem a strange thing to say. In a church, how can I be running from God? We've just been singing about him. We've just been um, hearing from the Bible. We've been praying. How can, we be, how can I be running from God? Well, uh, today, the reality is that we can all be doing it. We can be doing it in a way that is not very obvious. We can do it in a way that is subtle and hidden. Because in our hearts, we can be far from God, even if we're in the right place and doing the right things. We're all a bit like Jonah. We can run from him. It can be really subtle, but it could be really obvious. And that we're doing things in our life that are going against God, and we are running from his word and his ways. Jonah, the book we're going to look at for the next uh, few weeks, uh, was a prophet. He was a messenger of God. And we're going to see that God calls him to do something very specific. But God is also concerned, not just about what the work he's called him to do, but God is concerned about Jonah and concerned about his heart. And God has a work not only to do through Jonah, but in him as well. And for each one of us here, if you're a Christian, God has called you. He's called you to do something, to serve him. But he he isn't just concerned about the work he's called you to do. He's concerned about you and your heart in the midst of what he's called you to do. He wants you, God wants you to know the greatest of joys, the greatest peace. He wants you to know freedom and satisfaction. He wants you to know life in his his fullest because he wants you to know him. But we have this tendency to run away from God. You see it throughout the whole Bible. It starts there in the Garden of Eden where um, Adam and Eve turn away from God. And you just see it time and time again and it still happens now. We have this tendency to turn from him and to run from him. John Calvin, the uh, the 16th century theologian, said, if we want to know wisdom, how life works best, that's what wisdom is, to know how life works best, we need to know God. Because by knowing God, we get to know ourselves. So the more we know and understand about God, the more we know and understand about ourselves. And so this book, I pray, will help us to get to know God better, but as we see Jonah's life as well, help us to get to know ourselves better and to uh, grow in our likeness of Jesus. There's three headings for us this morning. We'll, um, you'll see them as they come on the screen. Uh, but the first heading is this. Why do we run from God? Why do we run from God? Look at verse one with me of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. Now, so far, there's nothing that unusual. Jonah was a prophet, and we meet him in two kings. We'll talk about that in a, in a few moments' time. We meet him before in two kings. He comes after um, Elijah and Elisha. And so his job was to speak God's word to God's people. So he was called to hear what God said, and then he would share it. But as we see, the word of the Lord coming to Jonah isn't that surprising. But the next line is, because it tells us, do you see what it tells us? Uh, what it tells Jonah to do in verse 2? Arise and go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh, we're told, he's t- he's told to go there, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now, why was that so surprising? Well, really, Jonah, normally, well, he's called to speak to God's people. Nineveh was not part of God's uh, nation. He was outside, he was in Assyria. And so when Jonah hears that, he runs. He goes the opposite direction. Why does he do that? Why does he run? Why do we run? Well, I think the first thing we see here, why did Jonah run? He didn't trust God. He didn't trust God. Who is Jonah told to go to preach to? The Ninevites. That is the capital of Assyria he's told to go and the Assyrians as I said were God's enemies God's people's enemies and it says that the evil had come up to God he had seen it what kind of evil well if you read the history books it's horrendous what the Assyrian empire got up to they were a brutal and cruel people this is what the kind of things they would do to their enemies they would force people their enemies to walk down the streets with big poles and on the top of the poles the heads of their loved ones And they forced people to do that. 
they would capture people and they would cut off um, most of their limbs except for one hand, one arm, so that they could mock them to shake their hand when they defeated them. They would uh, burn children at the stake. They would take people, if they didn't kill them, they would take them and, and just have them and use them as horrendously as slaves. This was a cruel, brutal people. And so the evil that they had had come up before God, obviously, really, because it's so horrendous what they did. But Jonah's been called to go to them and tell them that God has seen what they're doing and he's not happy. So at the best, what was, what was Jonah to expect? Well, he's going to be tortured or be a slave. At worst, he's going to be brutally killed. But we also know something else about Jonah, and this comes at the end of the book. We have to spoil it, sorry, uh, to, to understand this passage. If you look with me in chapter 4, verse 2, we see the reason Jonah didn't want to go to uh, Nineveh. It says this, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Jonah didn't want to go because he didn't want to give Assyrians, the Ninevites, a chance to repent and turn to God. He didn't want them to be saved from God's judgment. Isn't that interesting? Why was Jonah running? Because he didn't want them to be saved or rescued. He hated them. God wanted him to do something, and Jonah thought, I don't trust you, God. I don't like what you're saying. I'm going to go the other way. I wonder this morning when we ask the question to ourselves, why do we run from God? Why do we turn away from him? I wonder, are you avoiding him? Are you keeping God at an arm's length? Are you not listening to him because ultimately you don't trust his heart? You don't believe that he's good? Maybe there's something in the Bible you find hard to believe or hold on to. Maybe there's something in your life that's happened and you just can't work out how could God be loving and good if that's happened. And it's just hard to reconcile. And so you're keeping God at arm's length. Or maybe you're running from him. Maybe you know God is asking you to do something or to stop doing something or to, uh, to say something or to not say something. And you just you say to God, no. You know that's what he's saying, but you don't really trust him that it's good because you don't trust him. You don't trust his heart. And so as a result, you're just running further and further away to God, from God. You're going to Tarshish rather than where God wants you to go. God in his love today is coming to each one of us and he is saying, stop running. Let me show you how good I am. Let me show you that you can trust me in the midst of life. I love you. I am good. We're going to see that as we work through this passage. But can you see that in your heart? Why do we run? Well, one of the reasons is, just like Jonah, we don't trust God and his goodness. But the second reason I think Jonah runs here is because he doesn't really know himself. Why does he respond like this? So, Because Jonah's response, his, his outward response, res- shows us what's going on inside, in his heart. He was this respected religious man, this prophet. But he didn't go because he didn't want God to be gracious and kind to Nineveh. Now we meet Jonah in another place in the Bible, as I mentioned earlier, in 2 Kings 14. And you can read it there. It's when King Jeroboam II was king and Israel were in danger. Uh, And so they were struggling in different ways. Jonah comes and he gives a message from God to the king. Uh, And the king listened. And because of that, they strengthened their borders with Assyria, where Assyria might have attacked. And and so they did that. The king listened. And because of that, he saved Israel. So Jonah was this kind of hero prophet who came along and said, this is what you need to do, king. The king did it. And so uh, uh, he saved them from the Assyrians. He saved them from the enemy. So in one sense, Jonah was this hero in his own nation. He protected them against the horrible, evil Assyrians. But no doubt that made him proud. He doesn't like the Assyrians. He doesn't want God to deal with them. He's proud to be a prophet, proud to be able to say things and do things which made him look good in that sense to his people. But now God tells him, I want you to go to those Assyrians. I want you to go to the enemies and I want you to tell them and warn them about my coming judgment to give them a chance to turn back to me. Jonah shows us here, look, um, he would rather... Uh, them dead and destroyed and saved. 
He didn't want to be the prophet who would be the one who rescued and saved or was part of God's plan to do that for the enemies that nobody else liked. So at the surface, Jonah was this upright man, this prophet, seemed religious, you know, he, he seemed to be doing the right thing. But in his heart, something was controlling him more than God. He was not listening to God. Instead, he was listening to something else. Something else had power over him. And that command to go to God's enemies had exposed where his heart was really at. He hadn't been dealing with this sin, uh, with this power that was controlling him. And then it shows him for what it really is now, because he hates the enemies. Jonah hadn't realised there was something bigger than God in his heart that was controlling him. Remember the Ten Commandments? What's the first? Have no other gods before me. What was Jonah doing? Well, he was failing right there, wasn't he? Because there was something more important than God, something that had more control over him than God. So he was looking down on this other nation. He didn't want them to be saved. He didn't want to have the reputation different to the one he had now. Something else was more important to him. I wonder today, as we kind of find ourselves in our lives in different ways, running away from God, is that because something is more important to us than God and we're listening to that instead of listening to him perhaps like Jonah something has happened into your life something has come into your life it's an interruption and it's shaken you and you don't know where to turn and it's exposed that actually you were trusting in something else other than God and that's tempted you to run from him when discomfort comes the temptation is to flee from him and maybe God is showing us that this morning. Maybe he's showing you that. That you've been putting your trust in something. In comfort, maybe. In, um, in your reputation. Or, or in something else. And, and God comes along and brings something into your life. And it shows you, actually, this was really important. I didn't realise how much of a hold this had on me. But now it's being shaken. I don't know what to do. And it's shown that, actually, instead of worshipping God, you were worshipping this other idol. You were, something else was more important. But God, in his love today, wants to show you, look, if you put anything above me, if you build your life on anything but me, you're on shaky ground. If you put your trust in anything other than me, it's going to let you down. It's going to fail you at some point. Put your trust in somebody who will never fail you. Somebody who's going to uh, set you free rather than control you. Put your trust in me, God is saying. So the reasons we run... One is that we don't trust God. And there is, we don't know our hearts, we don't know ourselves and what we're actually following, what we're actually listening to. That's one, uh, two reasons why we run from God. But let's look at the second heading now. What happens when we run? So Jonah here was running away from God. So what happens when we run? Notice something that happens here. Jonah is told something quite clearly, isn't he? It's very obvious from God. It's not kind of like, oh, I wonder what God is saying here. He doesn't need to discern. It is clear. Arise, so get up, go to Nineveh. Okay, Nineveh is um, modern-day Iraq, Mosul. That's where it's, that's been built on the old ruins of Nineveh. He's told to go to Iraq, okay? And Nineveh is at the, on the south of Spain. So instead of going one direction, he goes totally the other, as far, like the end of the world as far as he's concerned. He can't get further from where he should be. Now, what's going on here? Well, in this passage, God wants to warn us about the danger of running away from him. Notice first what he's trying to run from. We see this phrase come up time and time again in chapter 1. Uh, verse 3, he says, He rose to flee to Tarshish, where? from the presence of the Lord. And at the end of that verse, again, we're told he did that to get away from the presence of the Lord. And further down, when he's talking to the people on the ship, he tells us he's running from the presence of the Lord. Now, literally translated, it's not presence, but face. He's running from the face of the Lord. That is, he doesn't want this connection with God, this pres the felt presence of God, this intimacy with God. He doesn't want that. He wants to get away from it. So in this moment, Jonah is running away from what he was designed to be. We were designed to be in the presence of God in the Garden of Eden. That's what we were made for. And Jonah, in that moment, runs away from what he's meant to be. We were created to be in the presence of God, to enjoy him. But he flees from it. 
Now, do you know, he, Jonah would have known um, the Psalms that tell us that you can't flee from my presence. You can't get away from me, God says. Jonah knew the information that he couldn't get away from God. But there's something about sin and fleeing from God and rebelling against him that doesn't have any logic at all to it. Sin makes us illogical. It does. We end up doing things or saying things or believing things that don't make any sense. Just like Jonah here. He knew God was everywhere, but still he tried to flee from the presence of God. Are you doing something at the moment in your life that doesn't make any sense? And you know it's against what God wants for you, but you're still doing it anyway. Have you ever done something or said something and thought, why did I say that? Why did I do that? I'm just fed up and frustrated. Maybe this morning you're holding a grudge or bitterness and you know you shouldn't. You know it's tearing you up inside, but you just can't help it. It doesn't make sense, but you're doing it. You know it's wrong. You see, when we flee from God, we, things become illogical. We enter into a chaos, a mess. And God this morning says, look, you're in danger. He wants to warn us and says, come back. Stop running. As we flee away from God, we, end, we go further away from what we were created to be further from what he wants us to be. I wonder this, this morning, are you running from the presence of God? Or as you look at your life in another way, are you, maybe think back to this last week, are there things that you wouldn't have done if you'd have known God was with you? So you might just say, oh, I'm fleeing. I know God is everywhere. Yeah, we'll tick that kind of theological fact. I know that. But then when we look at our lives, we say things or do things. And we wouldn't have done that if we'd have acknowledged that God was present with us. So in our life, we are fleeing from him. Remember, we were created to live in God's presence before his face. Listening to him. We were created to follow him, to enjoy him. And when we go away from that, we're in danger. One of the lies that the devil tells us is actually before God's presence is um, darkness. Before God's presence is restrictions and it's not good. You need to be free from that. But actually the Bible tells us, no, we were created for that. That's where we are most free. Remember the illustration of a beached whale, uh, which I, I love because it gets across what we were created for. A beached whale, where is it made to be? It's made to be in the sea. That's where it is. So if you were to go along to the beach in um, Aberavon and you found a whale there, you would say, right, let's get this back into the sea. You might need some help to push it back in. But then you'd get some help and you'd get it back and then it'd be in the sea. That's where we were created to be. But, you know, if you found, say, a, an eagle and it was struggling, you wouldn't then go to the sea and say, go on, eagle, go into the sea to, to swim. No, because the eagle's created a sword in the air. What's it created for? The whale's made for the sea, the eagle for the air. Humans are made for relationship with God. That's what we're created for, to live before his presence, to, to see him face to face. That's what life is for and about. But Satan wants us to think, oh no, that's not life. So this morning, God in his kindness is patiently showing us again, if you're in danger of wandering from God, if you are wandering from him, come back, come back to him. See, the danger here is shown, isn't it? Where, where God says, get up, arise. And did you notice the word that we see coming up time and time again? But Jonah went down to Joppa. He went down after he paid the fare. And you keep on reading, he goes down into the ship. His descent is downward. And then he goes down to the fish, to the depths. When we go away from God, the only way is down. That's the warning. So come back. Come back to him. The warning is when you flee from God, when you run from him, which is another way of describing sin, is you're in danger. In the same way, if you're sitting in your um, living room and the cushion's on fire, you don't just sit and say, oh, it's okay, it's only a cushion. It's fine. Thankfully, nothing else is burning. No, because the nature of fire is to consume. The nature of sin is to take over. And God is warning us this morning, come back to me. Don't flee. Do you know, in one way, it's really easy to run away from God. Really easy. Did you notice that when um, Jonah went down uh, to Joppa, there was a ship going to Tarshish? Oh, look, a ship going in totally the opposite direction to what God wanted to me, me to do. 
There will always, when it comes to temptation and sin and going away from God, there will always be a boat to Tarshish. There'll always be a way to keep going further from his presence. If you want to go away from God, there'll always be a boat. It'll always be easy. So today, God is saying, look, what happens when you run from me? It's illogical. You're in a place where you're you're entering into chaos and you're going away from what you're meant to be and it is dangerous. See, if we run from God, we're entering a mess and darkness. And so this morning he's saying, come back. Come back in his patience and in his love. You know, when we think we're running from God's face, from his presence, and we think he doesn't offer joy, listen to what Psalm 16 says. In your presence, there is fullness of joy and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore don't let satan tell you otherwise he is inviting you to come back into the presence of one who wants to fill your life with that reality and the further we go away from him the more our life ends in chaos and mess maybe this morning you know you're running you can see your life just tumbling into chaos and mess Well, God in his kindness is saying, look, come back. Come back to me. This is his warning to you. He wants to win you back. Now, maybe you're thinking, okay, I can see that God wants me to come back, but I'm just going to run a bit more. Maybe next week. Yeah, or maybe maybe, um, in a few weeks' time, a few months' time, then I'll come back. But we really need to be careful. If we hear God's voice now, don't harden your hearts. Listen to how Martin Lloyd-Jones puts it in his book on Revival. Be careful how you treat God, my friends. You may say to yourself, I can sin against God and then of course I can repent and go back and find God whenever I want him. You try it. And you'll sometimes find that not only can you not find God, that when you do, you you do not even want to. You'll be aware of a terrible hardness in your heart and you can do nothing about it. There's only one thing to do. Turn back to him and say, Oh God, do not keep on dealing with me as I deserve. Soften my heart, melt me. I cannot do it myself. Cast yourself utterly upon him and his mercy and upon his compassion. See, when we put it off, when we put off repenting and come back to God, we're in a dangerous place. So this morning, if you are hearing this voice, his voice, come back to him. Come back to him. And this is why the final point tells us this. So why do we run from God? Well, we run because we don't trust him. And we don't know ourselves and our hearts are being pulled away by all these different idols. What happens when we run? We're entering into darkness and chaos and it's a warning for us. Come back. So what is our hope? Well, our hope is in our third point, which is this. We've got a God who runs. We've got a God who runs. What do we mean? Well, Jonah's on the run. What hope is there for him? Well, God doesn't just say, Jonah, I'm going to leave you go. Jonah, that's it, fine. You want to go to um, Tarshish? Uh, I'll let you go to Tarshish. No. Verse 4 tells us this. We'll look more at this section next time. But look at those, those um, three words there. But the Lord. But God. God sent the storm. And we're going to look next week about how that storm was full of grace and love. But God. Jonah wasn't left on his own. God didn't just say, fine, get on with it. But no, he sent a storm to bring him back. He cared about him too much just to let him go. And our hope this morning, as we think of running from God, isn't, right, I need to sort this out. I need to pull my socks up, roll my sleeves up. I need to sort this out. No, God has got a plan. And God's, in a very special way, Jonah shows us what God's plan is for us. What is our hope this morning? Well, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus said that one greater than Jonah is here. Saying, I'm the greater Jonah. So as we look through this book, we're going to see that Jesus is greater than Jonah in loads of different ways. But one way I want us to see this morning that helps us to win our heart back is this. This is how one commentator put it. See, God said to Jonah, Jonah, I want you to go to another place. And I want you to do a different work for the sake of the people I love. People who are facing imminent judgment. Jonah, will you go? What does Jonah say? No. He's the prophet, the word, who was given the word from God, and he said no. 
but now consider Jesus the greater Jonah. He was in heaven, ruling the universe by the word of his power, adored by angels. He was in the best and the safest place, the most place of wonderful comfort. And then the father says to him, will you go to another place where you're going to be utterly rejected, live a life that will lead to torture, crucifixion and death, pain and heartache? Will you do the work of becoming an atoning sacrifice for the people I love who are facing eternal judgment? And what did the greater Jonah Jesus say? Yes, I'll go. I'll go for you. See, Jesus has come and he is not leaving you. And maybe this morning he's using this as a way to to say, look, I'm after you. Don't go any further. Come back. It's not for us to run to him. But we have got a God who comes and makes the first move and runs to us. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a Christian. And you've been running from God all your life. You've been putting him off. You're saying, I don't want him. I don't want him to come. I don't want him anywhere near. Well, God is after you this morning. And he's saying, come, trust in me. I've come, I've sent my son to save and rescue you. You can have all your sins forgiven. A fresh start here and now because of Jesus. Won't you turn to him? And maybe as a Christian here this morning, you've been running for weeks or months, even years in your heart. And you've run and you've run and you've run. Well, look, Jesus has come. And he says, stop running. Stop running. You know, as we look through this book, it does remind us of another story that Jesus says, doesn't it? Remember the story of the, the prodigal son? He had two sons and the youngest son went to the father and said, I want all my inheritance now. And he took that money and he squandered it in a faraway country. He ended up eating with the pigs. And then he realised, what am I doing? You know, my servants have got a better life than this. I'm going to go back to my father. And I'll just be a servant in the house then. At least I'll get a meal better than this fig, pig food that I'm eating. And so he turns back. And what happens? As he turns, he sees that his father is already running to wrap his arms around him and welcome him home. You see, the reality is... God the Father runs to us to welcome us back. So this morning in our heart, if you've been running and wandering, and this morning you feel that pull to turn around, don't think that, right, I need to have a really good month now and then maybe God will have me back. He's already there waiting. He's running towards you to wrap his arms around you to say, welcome home, welcome back. Why do we run from God? Because we don't trust him. But then we look at the God who runs and he says he is good, and he is kind, and he loves me, I can trust him. So with this thing that I'm finding hard to understand why he's allowed it, or why he's doing it, or why he's asking me to trust it, trust him, he's saying, look, you can trust me because I love you that much, I've come. And we don't know ourselves, do we? That's why we run, but God shows us, look, I know you, and I love you, and I'm better than any other idol you can have in your life because I've given my all for you. I've given it all. What happens when we run? We become illogical, become, we're not doing things that make sense, we become in danger, but the cross so shows us just how horrendous sin is and it unmasks the horror of sin to say, trust me, follow me. So if you've been running this morning, what's going to help you come back? It's the God who always and is already running to you. He's not running away from you. A God who loves you dearly, who knows all of your faults and still says, come he's he wants to embrace you even in the filth that we are covered in now he's not put off he doesn't turn his nose up but he comes to welcome us and to wash us clean so stop running and turn to him and see him running towards you this morning so let's pray and ask that we would live our lives in the light of his glorious grace towards us let's pray Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you're a patient God. And you know, Lord, those in this room who've been running from you, maybe in obvious ways, maybe in subtle ways. We pray that this morning you would help us to enjoy and return to you and to remember that you're the God who runs towards us to embrace us and welcome us home. Thank you, Lord, for the Lord Jesus Christ who willingly came, the greater Jonah, who didn't stay in a distant land, but came to save and to rescue us, to die on that cross so that we could be forgiven. And we praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.